Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. I'm your co-host, Tim Chelswick, along with Mr. Matt Drury. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm excited because we got another good guest this week. This is a guy... Almost as good as the guest we had last week. I don't know about that, but... (laughs) (laughs) We're just about the same. (laughs) About the same level. But uh, I'm excited because, you know, I learned a lot the last podcast. This guy is just a wealth of knowledge, frankly. And we could use that between the two of us. Absolutely, yeah. A real scientist, Tim Newman, wildlife biologist for Analogics Outdoors. Tim, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me back. You know, I forgot to say, some people are listening to this show... Some people are watching it on YouTube or DeerCast. For those that are watching, those are two pretty big bucks behind you, man. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could say those are my own. Uh, that was <laughs> the owner of Analogics, uh, Mark Freeze from Texas. Oh, well, so. then Mark Drury helped him get those. <laughs> <laughs> those don't count. Yeah. I, have, I have a weird thing about... Put, like I found a couple deadheads, like some really nice deadheads, and I have a hard time putting them up in my house because I don't want people to think that I shot them. Is uh, that get over it? Is that a, is is that? I mean, <laughs> yeah. guys, get a salvage tag. Get the pick I, def- them up. I definitely have a salvage yeah, tag. About I just, the animal, not your not your own pride. It's about what I was able to grow on my farm. What, was what to find I out. may have been able to shoot if I were a better hunter. Or what someone hit with a car and I found two months later. Yeah. That's probably more, more accurate. Okay. Keep it in the garage then. Euro mount it, put it in the garage. Yeah, yeah. Or put know. it like on the front of my truck, like yeah. boss hog. There we go. I think that'd be nice. Let's do it. Nice addition. <laughs> Oh, so last week we got to talk about uh, deer nutrition, herd health, how to ensure that the deer have the right nutrients. If you didn't listen to that show, go back, podcast it, and um, and check it out. This uh, this week's show is is a little different. We're talking about estrus and kind of taking advantage of when does come into estrus and what that process looks like. So uh, so one of our listeners, actually a deer caster from Georgia asked us a a great question it's our question of the day all right the question of the day is brought to you by bass pro shops and cabela's your adventure starts here uh yes this is kevin brown from lagrange georgia troop county my question is um when the does go in estrus and if they don't get bred do they come back in uh estrus in 28 in 28 days this is what i've always heard and i just wanted for someone else to tell me Thanks. You know, me too. <laughs> uh, we pretty much know the answer, but we should check with Tim to see just as a if our opinions yeah, differ. Yeah. So, why don't you tell Tim, us? Tim, you first, go first, Tim, and then we'll tell you if you're right or not. <laughs> so, when a deer does not get bred after her initial estrus, she after after her initial estrus, she will go in somewhere between 21 to 30 days. She will recycle again, and the average occurs usually after 25 days. So does does age structure uh, matter? Do more mature does tend to get bred first, and then younger ones? Like, is does that play into that sequence? Yes. Normally, the mature does will get bred at the beginning of the the bell curve of when deer will breed throughout the entire breeding season. Mm-hmm. The the younger deer, especially the fawns, that will breed their first year when they're you know six to eight months. They, they will usually not go into estrus at the first point when the mature does are going into estrus. So their first cycle actually occurs in December. And if they get missed, then they will breed in January. And here, here's a fun fact for you. Uh, if a doe does not get bred, she can recycle up to seven times before she stops. So, so how late does that put it then where she could actually... So, so that, that would be you know getting bred in... June is that right <laughs> or no it'd be uh, basically starting over <laughs> it, 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 it would be getting bred in uh, like April or May and then having a fawn in November but that is 
counterproductive in the evolutionary scale because those fawns aren't going to survive the winter in most of the U.S. It does but, kind of explain every now and again you hear during deer season, like later into deer season, you you hear people talking about seeing young of the year with spots on them still. Well, and you hear about the second rut, I feel like, you know, oh, it's totally, like a, yeah. a term that gets thrown around and you really don't know probably a lot about it, but you always kind of hear in the Midwest here, it was like uh, December, mm-hmm. late Late November, December, or maybe mid-December, it's like, yeah, it's the second rut. Oh, okay. Well, but really, it's probably just that these does cycle again, wave. right? Yeah. Yep. And the the difference between um, humans and whitetails is, you know, humans are on the menstrual cycle, so they actually shed their endometrium, whereas the whitetails, they humans, reabsorb that. that. Sorry, I was just clarifying between genders. Sorry, I, Tim's I being a smartass. <laughs> shed my endometrium. I don't even have an endometrium. <laughs> right. <laughs> Start over and let's hear the whole thing. <laughs> so, you know, in the human world, if a female does not get bred, then she basically flushes the toilet on her ability to oh. have young from that. <laughs> I think we should scratch this <laughs> thought process, that, Tim. Th- there's probably a more scientific way of saying that, but basically yeah, you think? they <laughs> <laughs> the menstrual cycle, they shed the endom- endometrium, whereas in animals that have an estrus versus a menstrual cycle, the estrus cycle, they resorb that endometrium oh. and then cycle again after. I mean, different I, I animals think about will that. cycle at different you know, longevity periods, yeah. you know, based on the size of the animal. But 21 to 30 days is the range that it takes a whitetail to recycle. I stopped listening after you said flushed it. <laughs> yeah, that, that may be a first for the show. <laughs> Continue. So, so, Tim, I, I'm curious then because we know that that uh, that with bucks, their testosterone spikes, and that, that's what, you know, that's that's part of the rut. What happens to a doe that is cycled maybe two or three times before getting bred if you've got bucks that are kind of ramping down on their testosterone? Are they pretty much any time they're ready to go, but just at, at the peak of the rut, they're, they've got more testosterone? How does that work? The, the bucks will breed a doe at any time. As, if, if she will stand there and not run away from him as he tries to mount, That's they can the breed at any time of the year. And you sometimes see that with uh, deer in the summer, you know, you'll see a deer try and mount another one just because it's standing there still. And you're like, what's going on? <laughs> you don't keep looking. Though, Give it right? the old college try. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, uh, guys will be guys. <laughs> this podcast is totally <laughs> yeah, in the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a bunch of 12 I, mean, I feel boys like we over. might get in trouble on this one. <laughs> <sighs> So we need to That's kind assault, of br- brother. Br- bring it back around. So how, how about implications for a hunter then? Like how does a, a deer hunter take advantage of knowing that does are coming into estrus kind of in, in kind of a phased approach? Well, you can look at it just like you've seen um, people talk about it, the second rut. That is a time where you can catch a lot of the mature bucks because they – are really scrapping for those last few does that have not been bred. So the the second rut, there's a lot fewer does that are going into estrus. Mm-hmm. So the competition is is very fierce. Okay. Would there be a time frame that like a general time frame that you would call the second rut? I mean, I'm sure it's different for obviously for different areas. You know, down south. <laughs> right. Our it's, second it's rut is like the, they, they I usually the first one. Look yeah. at it about December seventh on in the Midwest where our average conception date is November 14th. Gotcha. So it's, it's usually about a week before the peak breeding is when they start ramping up for that second rut. You know, one of the things we, we talk about uh, when when folks got deer cast, they were saying, well, how is this going to be relevant for my area? Our rut isn't like it is in the Midwest. It's later or it's a little earlier. And actually within deer cast, you can set your peak estrus date mm-hmm. to whatever – whatever fits your locality. And there are presets in there, but you know, we, we try to research and get certain presets for certain areas, but 
by and large, if you're outside of the Midwest in that November 14th period you Mm -hmm. were talking about, you ought to just talk to a biologist in your specific area, or you may already know it just yourself, what what you feel like that date is. But that is kind of the beauty of the the software. You could change it, and then it slides the whole scale your direction. Right. And so, Tim, that that was kind of my question. Who would you suggest people reaching out to, whether they have deer cast or not, if they just want to know, like, the best science on when the peak estrus is for their area? There should be a biologist from the state agency where they live that would know that data. And most of that data comes from harvesting deer that are pregnant and they do fetal measurements Mm. and they can backdate. There's a scale that was made by the founder of the QDMA. Another fun fact, the, the scale was literally produced by the guy that started QDMA, Mm. Joe Hamilton, but that scale, you can backdate conception date based on fetus size. Okay. So, so reach out to your DNR here in Missouri, the department of conservation. And 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 the, the, the biggest, the, the state that has the most, um, differences throughout their breeding season would be Florida. I mean, I, mm. I know of 10 different months out of the year where certain parts of Florida, the deer are in rut. Oh, yeah. We geez. looked at, we looked at that pretty hard for deer cast when we were trying to make these presets and it was mm-hmm. a nightmare like that, Alabama, they were just nightmares. And, and I had heard that in Florida, the reason why it was so different and, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that the way that they had brought in so many different deer different from subspecies. other species yeah subspecies from other areas to kind of try to populate the state uh-huh. th- th- so they kind of brought their own uh, you know estrus cycles or whatever you know sure. rut cycles with them is that the case is that true yeah so the maternal genetics really carry the timing of the estrus from one generation to the next so if a doe is brought in to georgia because this question was from Georgia, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. But if that doe came from Wisconsin, then that doe throughout its lifetime will have a Wisconsin rut, a November rut. Wow. Whereas if it- that doe was captured from South Florida and brought to Georgia, then it's going to have a little bit different rut and might end up later than the November rut. Well, so does that then carry through generation to generation? It does, but then it starts to diffuse the farther you get away from the source population. So if they brought in a bunch of deer from Wisconsin, they they hold that rut phase for longer, whereas if they've only brought a couple of them, then it kind of gets washed out by the local genetics. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how much of the source population ends up in the breeding population. It kind of related, and and Tim, we 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 didn't preload you on this, so you may or may not know some of the research around this or if there is any, but I know like in humans are talking about epigenetics and how different factors in your life can cause genes to express themselves differently. And, and your genetics can actually change over your life based on your environment. Is there any mm-hmm. kind of research like that happening in the whitetail world? And if so, what is, what does that look like? They have done some research out of Michigan that I can think of right off the top of my head that they looked at sex ratio of different fawns and when i when i say that they based it on a nutritional plane so they they fed some deer a high quality nutritional ration and then another group of deer a low quality and they found that the sex ratio was not you know one male fawn for every one female Mm -hmm. fawn it was different throughout the nutritional mixes so when they had better nutrition they tended to have more female fawns and when they had poor quality nutrition, they tended to have more male fawns. And their theory was that when there were more male fawns hitting the ground, they would disperse to areas that might have better resources in order to be successful. Maybe that's why our buck to doe ratio is always so out of whack. Because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of nutrients there at the farm. There's food plots. There's food galore, Mm -hmm. frankly. You've been giving yourself a lot of does. We've (laughs) bred a bunch of does, I think. (laughs) It's a blessing and a curse. I mean, if you think think about it, if you've got high-quality nutrition, you might throw two more does than you do buck fawns. So. It's just something you got to keep up with shooting those. Yeah, which is the the real work that goes into mm-hmm. it, frankly. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's amazing. We st- like that's the fascinating thing to me about the biology behind whitetail hunting and whitetails in general. We know a lot, but there's still so much that we don't know. We're we still- don't know a lot. <laughs> we as in others. <laughs> yes. I'm relatively dumb on this subject. But there, well, but it's, like the, it's the a research- great opportunity to teach people. I mean, the scientific community as a whole is learning things all the time. So it's it's sucks that it takes so long for these research projects to get published just to be accepted in the peer-reviewed literature and then people you know have to read about it in the um other magazine sources so it, it takes a long time for scientific information to really get distributed like it should and it it's county, obviously gotten a lot faster than it used to be thanks to social sure. media yeah and, and i'm sure some of it gets filtered through kind of a pop science filter and so you just got to be careful about who you're reading where it's coming from the credibility of the source to make sure you're not getting spin absolutely so so are there some uh, authoritative sources that you trust when you are reading maybe not necessarily a, like a deep research paper but just in general who do you trust in terms of whitetail research and knowledge you know i i like the three big um, deer schools are Georgia, Mississippi State, and Auburn, and some would argue Tennessee is in that mix too, but any of the information that those research, you know, the universities are putting out, that is pretty solid stuff. Even if it's not in a peer-reviewed journal yet, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, progress reports, updates of their research. It's very good information. So you you got to figure out, like, if deer and deer hunting posts a article you look at the author, and if they're from one of those universities, then you can kind of look at, okay, that, that makes more sense. I can take that more to heart than yeah. if some random hunter that doesn't have a biology background is just posting things. You have to be so discerning because everyone has a platform these days. Look, I mean, it's, that's yeah. social media. That's we, we see it in politics. We see it in every facet of our lives. And I, I just I hate to say this. I just had a, a – different somebody because i've been seeing her talking about vax uh, she's a non-vaxxer or whatever and i yeah. whatever your beliefs but i don't believe that i vaccinated my kids and mm-hmm. and uh she puts out a lot of information that's just not factual you look at it and and you read like what website it came from you go to the website it's like Ugh. like yeah. i might as well be in some back this alley website. for this thing yeah <laughs> so you just gotta watch where you're getting your information totally. and and i think that's the tough part about our society today, we're just not betting things. It's just like, oh, a lot of people don't read past the headline. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's true. When when I first started my undergrad work, one of my professors said, "Why are you guys trying to get a degree in wildlife? Have you ever been to a DNR meeting? Everybody already has a degree in wildlife." Yeah, they already know what's best. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Sad but true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. A lot of good info again today. Yeah. I mean, that's. I think we could have a maybe. Maybe we should trade Tim's and get this Tim on for every podcast. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll get some stuff done. <laughs> Who My can name we trade is always slightly me? easier to spell. I don't know. <laughs> well, oh man, he just dissed your name. Yeah, I know. I'm used to it. Uh, so thank you to Kevin for offering the great question. Kevin gets a Drury Outdoors ball cap for submitting the question. If you want to submit a question to the show, go to juryoutdoors.com slash podcast. Uh, that'll take you to our podcast page. In the lower right-hand side of the screen, there's a send a voicemail tab. Send us your question and keep it to around a minute. And let us know who you are, where you're from, and we'll do our best to get it answered on the air. As always, you can follow along on the video version of the podcast uh, on our Drury Outdoors YouTube channel and DeerCast and under DOD TV. Um, and, you know, we got all kinds of cool content coming out right now. A bunch of spring turkey stuff's getting ready to hit the pipeline. Um, always got some good gamekeeper tips in there yeah. and uh, just all kinds of stuff happening. So please follow along. If you haven't and you didn't know about it, we're giving away a farm here for our what? 30th anniversary. So go download DeerCast, the DeerCast app. It's free. Download it. And you can click to sign up for that farm giveaway. 60 acres in North Missouri. This thing is sweet. It'll take you probably a minute seriously name and email address and the other cool part about it you're automatically then entered for all these monthly like thirty three thousand dollars worth of monthly prizes from our partners we've given away in a two uh, pallets of yeah. biologics. We're giving away uh, biologic seed right now in, in March. I mean, there. I think coming up here, maybe April 
or May, we're having a Genesis drill, I believe, from, from RTP, RTP Outdoor. So, I mean, that's like an $8,000 implement for your farm. I mean, this is just some awesome gear. So, um, you know, check it out. We just want to say thank you guys. And uh, it's our 30th anniversary. It's a reason for us to celebrate. It's a big year. Yeah. It is. Tim, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing to the show. We appreciate it. We should probably shut this thing down. All right. If this podcast even lives to see the light of day after it may get scratched. We cover. It got, it got weird. <laughs> thanks right. for bringing us down a level. Nice job. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me, guys. See you. See you, Tim. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's.